Pluto is an object in the Kuiper Belt, which is a region of objects located beyond the orbit of Neptune. Though once considered the solar system's ninth planet, it was reclassified to a dwarf planet in 2006. Pluto's name comes from the Roman god of the underworld, and the Greek equivalent is Hades. Like Uranus and Neptune, Pluto cannot be seen in the night sky with the unaided eye. It's far too small and distant to be seen without a telescope. The first and currently only spacecraft to visit Pluto was New Horizons, which flew past the dwarf planet in 2015. New Horizons' examination of Pluto revealed a lot about the object. Because it's so far away, even some of the strongest telescopes on Earth have trouble making out any details of it, so New Horizons data gave us a lot of new information to work with. Pluto is perhaps most well known for its reclassification to a dwarf planet, which plenty of people are still upset about almost two decades later. But I think that frustration tends to overshadow all the other details about it. So come along with me as we take a closer look at Pluto. American astronomer Percival Lowell first suggested Pluto's existence in 1905. He offered it as an explanation for strange deviations in the orbits of Uranus and Neptune. This wouldn't be the first suggestion of its kind. Neptune was discovered entirely because of how it affects the orbit of Uranus. So if odd things were happening with both planets' orbits, it wasn't out of the question that something larger could be affecting them. Lowell then began efforts to locate and find this elusive ninth planet. Sadly, though, he passed away in 1916, before Pluto was ever discovered. Now we fast forward to 1930, when young astronomer Clyde Tumba had taken up the search for this evasive ninth planet. He spent many nights at the Lowell Observatory and numerous months scanning data for any sign of a single object moving just a little bit between two pictures. Finally, his search ended when he noticed a small object move just a few millimeters in two different pictures near the constellation of Gemini. This marked the discovery of Pluto. The suggestion for the object's name came from an 11-year-old girl named Venetia Burney, whose grandfather forwarded the suggestion to Lowell Observatory. The name also serves to honor Percival Lowell, the one who began the search for Pluto, as the name starts with his name's initials. Though disturbances in the orbits of Uranus and Neptune were what sparked the search for Pluto, astronomers eventually realized that Pluto could not be responsible for these anomalies. Its mass is just far too small to affect either planet in a noticeable way. For a good several decades, Pluto was considered the solar system's ninth planet, but in 2006, as you probably already know, it was reclassified to a dwarf planet. Why did this happen? In the decades after Pluto's discovery, astronomers began to theorize about the existence of a belt of objects beyond Neptune's orbit. This region's existence was finally confirmed in 1992 with the first discovery of a Kuiper belt object. Then more and more objects were discovered, many of them similar to Pluto, and a lot of these were more similar to Pluto than Pluto was to the other planets. These discoveries forced astronomers to have a good sit down and think about what exactly constitutes a planet. Until then, they'd never really made an attempt to agree on a standard definition for the word. Planet itself comes from a Greek word meaning wanderer. At one point, even the sun and moon were considered as falling into this category. After a lot of deliberation, the International Astronomical Union eventually came up with three criteria to define a planet. First, in order to be a planet, an object must be in orbit around the sun. Second, they must be massive enough for their own gravity to pull them into a roughly spherical shape. And third, they must have cleared their orbit of any objects of comparable mass and size to their own. Pluto meets the first two requirements pretty easily. It orbits around the sun and its shape is round, but it's the third criteria where it falls short. Since it's located in the Kuiper belt, there are plenty of similarly sized objects that might cross its orbital path. In the same resolution though, the IAU created the new classification of dwarf planets, which gave Pluto a new home. A dwarf planet is basically the same thing as a regular planet, except that it hasn't cleared its orbit of any debris. A few other objects have since been officially recognized as dwarf planets. Pluto's reclassification sparked controversy and debate both within the scientific community and among the general public. Plenty of people still think it should have remained as our solar system's ninth planet. Personally, I think it's better to have a clear and strict definition of planet, because it makes it easier to discuss these sorts of things. I also very much disagree with the idea that Pluto was demoted. There's no hierarchy of objects in space. It's not like regular planets rank above dwarf planets. That's that's just not how it works. Pluto orbits an average of about 3.7 billion miles from the sun. This places it around 40 times farther from the sun than Earth. At this distance, light takes about five and a half hours to reach it. Pluto's orbit is both very elliptical and tilted. At its furthest, it's about 49.3 astronomical units away from the sun. And 
at its closest, it's the much shorter, but still very large, 30 astronomical units away. An interesting little feature about Pluto's orbit is that sometimes, for about 20 years during its closest approach to the Sun, this little thing is actually closer to our solar system star than Neptune. This happened most recently from 1979 to 1999. Although Pluto sometimes crosses inside of Neptune's orbit, the two planets will never collide with each other. They're locked in a 3 to 2 orbital resonance. For every time that Neptune orbits exactly three times, Pluto orbits exactly twice. This fancy gravitational interaction ensures that the two objects will never come close enough to crash into each other. A day on Pluto, or the time it takes to rotate once, is about 153 hours, or around six Earth days. Its year is 248 Earth years. This means that from its discovery to its reclassification, it didn't even come close to completing one orbit around the Sun. Pluto's axis of rotation is tilted with respect to the point of its orbit around the Sun. I found conflicting numbers on this tilt. NASA's website says it's 57 degrees, while other sources say it's 120 degrees. Either way, the dwarf planet rotates almost on its side, and this results in some extreme seasonal variations. Somewhat uniquely, Pluto also rotates in the retrograde direction, which is opposite from the majority of planets in the solar system. The only planets that share this quality are Venus and Uranus. Pluto is about 1400 miles wide, making it just half the width of the United States and about two-thirds the width of the moon. Basically, it's pretty small, and due to its lower density, its mass is only a sixth that of the moon's. Because it's so far away from the sun, and because it lacks a substantial atmosphere, the surface temperatures on Pluto are very cold. On average, they're between negative 396 and negative 378 degrees Fahrenheit. Within Pluto's interior, it probably has a rocky core. This core may be surrounded by an ocean of water surrounded by a layer of frozen water ice. Evidence on this supposed subsurface ocean, however, is indeterminate. Pluto may have had a subsurface ocean at one point and then lost it, or it could still have it, or it just never had one at all. Ices like methane and nitrogen frost coat Pluto's surface. This surface also features very tall mountains made of water ice. These mountains can range from 6,500 to 9,800 feet in height, and they're often covered in gases like frozen methane. Crossing Pluto's surface are troughs and valleys as long as 370 miles. There are also craters as large as 162 miles across. Some of these show signs of erosion and filling, which suggests that tectonic activity is slowly resurfacing Pluto. The most prominent of Pluto's plains appear to be made of frozen nitrogen gas. These regions show no craters and have structures suggesting convection, blobs of material that circulate up and down. A particularly noteworthy feature of Pluto is the heart-shaped region called the Tumba Regio, which was named after its discoverer. The left side of this region is covered in carbon monoxide ice. In the center left is a very smooth region called the Sputnik Planum. This region lacks any craters caused by meteorite impacts, so that implies it's very young on a cosmological and geological scale. It's possibly still being shaped by geological processes. Compared with past images of Pluto, pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope seem to show that it has grown redder over time. This shift in color is apparently due to seasonal changes. Methane was first detected on Pluto in the 1970s. This alone was enough to suggest that Pluto had some kind of atmosphere, but it wasn't until 1988 that this atmosphere was fully confirmed. Astronomers observed Pluto passing in front of a background star. The star's light gradually dimmed just before it completely disappeared behind Pluto. This confirmed the dwarf planet's thin and expansive atmosphere. The atmosphere is primarily made of nitrogen, methane, and carbon monoxide. It has a blue tint and distinct layers of haze. The haze particles start high up in the atmosphere as ionized methane and nitrogen. As these ions interact, they combine into more complex molecules and they start to collect outer shells of volatile ices. As the haze particles grow in mass, they start to fall through the atmosphere and collect even more ice. This snow falls to the surface as a reddish-gray color. Pluto's atmosphere expands when the dwarf planet is closer to the sun and then collapses as it grows further away. In this way, it's similar to a comet. This happens because being closer to the sun causes the ices on the surface to sublimate or change directly from a solid to a gas. They then rise temporarily to form a thin atmosphere. The low gravity on Pluto causes the atmosphere to extend farther out from Pluto's surface than on Earth. When Pluto moves away from the sun, temperatures drop, and most of the atmosphere freezes again and falls back to the surface as snow. This makes the atmosphere almost completely undetectable. Pluto's current atmosphere is way too thin to allow for liquids to flow on its surface. In the past, though, that might have been different. New Horizons imaged a frozen lake that seemed to have ancient channels nearby, which implies that liquid once
atmospheres flowed there. At some point in the ancient past, Pluto could have had an atmosphere as much as 40 times as thick as that on Mars. In 2016, scientists announced the possible discovery of clouds in Pluto's atmosphere using data from New Horizons. They saw seven bright features near the boundary of daylight and darkness, which is where clouds commonly form. If these were indeed clouds, they could be composed of acetylene, ethane, and hydrogen cyanide. It's not known if Pluto has a magnetic field, but because it's so small and it rotates very slowly, it probably doesn't have one. That would also mean it has no magnetosphere. But hey, the detection of Mercury's magnetic field was a real shocker, so maybe there's still a little bit of hope that Pluto can have one too. Pluto is orbited by five known moons, and they're named Charon, Nix, Hydra, Kerberos, and Styx. Charon is the closest to Pluto, while Hydra is the most distant. This moon system might have formed from a collision early in the solar system's history. A very early Pluto could have collided with another object of a similar size, and most of the ejected material formed Pluto while the rest formed Charon. The other moons may have also formed from the same collision that resulted in Charon's formation. The first moon of Pluto discovered was Charon in 1978. Next were Nix and Hydra in 2005, then Kerberos in 2011, and finally Styx in 2012. Charon, the biggest moon, is so large that it and Pluto orbit each other like a double planet system. More specifically, they orbit a point in space between one another known as the barycenter. Charon is about half the size of Pluto, which makes it the largest moon relative to its host planet size. Charon and Pluto are tidally locked to each other, and this means that each one only shows one face of itself to the other. This also means Charon is at a fixed point in Pluto's sky. It doesn't move across or rise and set like Earth's moon does. The other four moons are much smaller than Charon, irregularly shaped, and they are not tidally locked to Pluto. The similarities in these moons' orbits suggest a common origin in that they probably weren't captured objects. While Pluto is named after the Roman god of the underworld, all of its moons take their names from other mythological figures associated with the land of the dead. Charon is the ferryman of the river Styx, who brings souls to the afterlife. Nyx is the goddess of dark and night, and also the mother of Charon. Hydra is a nine-headed serpent that guards the underworld. Kerberos is a three-headed dog from Greek mythology, and it often guards the gates of the underworld to prevent the dead from leaving. And the Styx is a mythological river that separates the land of the living from the land of the dead. I really think it's such a shame that, of all things it could be known for, Pluto is most famous for its reclassification to a dwarf planet. There are just so many other cool things about it. I mean, part of it looks like a heart. Isn't that neat? I intend to make a separate video on the moons of Pluto. I'm not expecting it to be super long or in-depth or anything, because there's only five of them, and I have a feeling we probably don't know much about many of them. Regardless of that fact, though, Though, I'm still going to do it because I'm the one in charge here and I get to decide what I do. I hope you enjoyed this little exploration of Pluto. It may no longer be our ninth planet, but we still hold it fondly in our hearts. Thanks for watching, like and subscribe if you enjoyed, and have a good day!